Happy May Day! It is a beautiful day, not only in the neighborhood, but uh, also in the neighborhood. Glad we're here. Uh, the flowers this morning are in honor of uh, Barry Waters and uh, their gorgeous. So I uh, really appreciate them and remember them fondly. Uh, we continue the season of Easter today until uh, Pentecost, which is at the beginning of June. So uh, Easter continues. Let us turn our hearts to worship God.
and blesses us every single day. Let us reaffirm that and let us turn to God in prayer using the words that are printed in the bulletin. Together we pray. Oh God, we yearn to be a community of believers united in your spirit, yet we are fraught with divisions, denominational, political, theological. We are weighed down by tensions and the things that break us apart. Forgive us, great God, for this great sin. Help us to learn to live in community together, loving one another in spite of our differences, and respecting one another in everything that we do and say. Help us to be as you call us, one in heart and mind. Only through the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, can we achieve this. Amen. In the silence of the next moments, I invite you to lift to God any personal prayers that are in your heart. miracle of resurrection is ours today and every single day. We are blessed by God's grace. God's mercy is poured over us. So we have received this gift of God. Let us rejoice in God's grace. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ. Amen. 
The gifts for you are in my office, so don't leave the building before you get a study Bible and a cross created by Norma Kaga, a crochet cross, which is a good bookmarker. So, and with that, let us welcome him into the congregation. morning is from Ephesians 1, 2 to 23. Grace to you and peace from God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he has set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who are the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, and for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of the glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put his work to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet, and has made him the head over all things of the church, with his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When the glory of the 
not as too old, no, wait a minute, I got it all mixed up. But there's some other verses to it, so I'm not going to share today. But that song, the refrain of it, the chorus of it that you just sang, has been rolling around in my head for uh, really a month, because I've been thinking about this sermon series on Ephesians. And that's basically the synopsis of the entire book of Ephesians. We are the church together. Ephesians as a book speaks of the unity we have in Jesus Christ and of each person's place in that unity of Jesus. And, uh, and that's what we're meant to be as people of God. Uh, as you probably know, I have been thinking about, um, I've mentioned this before, I have been thinking about long-range planning in the church, in this church specifically, and where we're going as a church, at least through the pandemic, because we had planned some things before the pandemic. And uh, then the world has changed, and the church has changed. And uh, the way people come to church or don't come to church the way we should be doing things at church has all changed and is changing. So, now the love of Christ is the same, period, as it always has been, but perhaps how we live out that love in the world has changed. So, we, we're thinking about what that means and uh, what that means for how we do church here at First Presbyterian Church of Garden. And we will be thinking about it for some time. Uh, uh, as I said, I'm thinking about it more specifically for this church and what will happen when I retire in four years. Now, four years is a long time. I realize that. But I also think it's going to sneak up on you. And uh, I also know practically uh, that when I retire, you're going to need to be ready. Uh, and, and you will be. God has this. God has it all under control. Um, to be ready, we need to start planning and thinking about it now. Now, I know also that I am not the church. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. I know that I'm not the church. I'm not the center of the church. And you are. And Christ is. Jesus Christ is the center of our church. So what does that mean? How do we move forward in faith? So Session is taking some baby steps this summer, I hope. Uh, to think about planning for the future, and the congregation as a whole will be invited into that process at some point. No plan yet. Um, but the first step, in my opinion, of all of this is to figure out who we are now, our identity as a church. Who, who is First Presbyterian Church of Garden? First, I am the church, we are the church, we are the church together. That's central. Uh, but realistically, think about what we do well, what we need to work on, uh, what we like, what we don't like, what, what's working, what's not working, and moreover, think about what we stand for. Think about who we think we are, uh, who God is calling us to be, um, and not only who we think we are, but who the people outside of the church think we are. What, are, what is that, do they match? Does the image of what Gardner thinks of us match with who we think we are? Um, again, most importantly, who do we believe God is calling us to be? And most importantly, to whom do we belong? We know that answer. We belong to God. Individually and collectively, we belong to God. That's what today's scripture was reminding us we belong to God. Creator and Redeemer, as known in Jesus Christ and lived in the Holy Spirit, we belong to God. The scripture reminds us that God has chosen us, chosen you, adopted us, and filled us with grace, with the fullness of God's presence, Christ's presence. We are children of God. We belong to God. We know who we are. And we do that as we remember God's love for us. As we remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. Then that is when we know who we are. Paul's letter to the Ephesians begins with this concept, this idea. Remember who you are. Reminding the young church 
the young Christian church of that day, who they are as children of God, reminding them of what is essential in the faith, the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. That is essential. Ephesians also begins with prayer, which you heard this morning. A prayer for them, a prayer for us. Prayer is always a very good place to start. Thanking God and asking God for wisdom and revelation, inspiration for what lies ahead. It's believed that Ephesians was written near the end of Paul's life, either by Paul or by someone assisting Paul. At the end of his life, Paul was arrested, we know this from the book of Acts, and taken to Rome for trial. And uh, this was a four or five year process just to go to trial, just to get there. We don't really know what happened after that because the letter of the uh, Book of the Acts uh, ends, so we're not sure exactly what happened So the last time we see Paul, he's in Rome, in prison, or under house arrest, waiting for trial. So Paul used that time to write and to think about the future of the church. Uh, unlike some of the earlier letters, uh, the Corinthians, the Philippians, um, those letters were written quickly to answer specific questions about something that was happening in the church, a problem or a situation. And two people Paul knew very well about incidents that were happening then. But unlike those letters, this letter to the Ephesians was written when Paul had time to gather his thoughts and to organize and to see the big picture. During this time in prison, Paul shifted from field work, you know, being out there traveling, preaching, founding new churches. Paul shifted to sustaining existing churches. And he wrote broad letters, very um, big letters about the life of faith, developing theology for the church. This letter to the Ephesians, the letter to the Colossians, and the letter to the Romans are examples of that. All are very broad in scope and character. Uh, they, they try to express the whole of the Christian faith, what is most important, what is fundamental and foundational. It answers the big questions like, what does it mean to be a Christian? How do we live as Christians? To be a follower of Jesus Christ, to belong to God, what do we do? Specifically and, and broadly. What does it mean to be a church? What sustains a church? What grows a church? What helps a church to serve God and to share God's love? These are answered in these other writings of Paul. And the answer right in the chapter you heard today, rooted in Christ, follow the plan of God. That's advice for us today as well. Rooted in, in Christ, follow the plan of God. Be together in love. There can be no more appropriate message for the church of today. Be together in love. What does that look like? Locally and globally. Be together in love. In our world of chaos and conflict, God's plan is unity and harmony. God's plan is love. Love is in the room. And not just for, for us, but for everyone. God's plan is for the entire world. God's plan through Jesus Christ is to bring the entire world together in love. Everyone. Knowing that we belong to God. Everyone. That's God's huge plan. It's, it's not just... Well, it's not us against the world, Christians against the world. It is us with God for the world. The entire world. God loves everyone. God wants everyone to know that. To experience that love. Miraculously, how God will accomplish that is through the church. Through you and me. The body of Christ in the world. The instrument or, or the organism in the world who will share God's love. That's our job. That is what the church is. God's 
tool, God's instrument in the world. God's love is our purpose in the world. And the only way to live love is through unity in Jesus Christ. We are one in purpose, one in love, one in spirit, one in Jesus Christ. So back to our church here in Gardner. We are God's church together in Jesus Christ with God's singular purpose of sharing God's love. Excuse me. <coughs> and as we strive to live into our call in the near future, we remember first we belong to God. God chose us. God chose you. And in so choosing, God has given us everything that we need to accomplish God's purpose, to love and to grow as a body of Jesus Christ. So the opening image in this reading today, in the, in the whole book of Ephesians, is belonging, adoption. We belong to God. And that adoption is a binding commitment of care and responsibility. Permanent, unbreakable togetherness. When a person joins the church, they answer questions, but so does the entire church. The entire church makes a commitment of care and responsibility. The image is family, God's family of faith. We belong to each other. Uh, the thing is, it's a huge worldwide family, Never, nevertheless, also an intimate and, and committed, close family. We belong to God. In so living, we also belong to each other, all of each other, including those far, far from us, everybody together in Christ, even those we may not agree with. We belong to God, so we belong to each other. We are the church together. Now, you know there is great diversity in this family of faith. We know that. Uh, what we don't always know is how we can live in unity, calling each other to, to be God's best. That's our job, to take care of each other, loving each other, loving, challenging, blessing, together in Christ. It is, it's much easier to say that those other people who don't think like I do are wrong. We are, it, it's easy to say, we're right, they're wrong, and, and we're doing the way things the right way. But Jesus says, we are meant to be united in Christ. Back to the song, we are the church together. So how do we do that? I mean, all this diversity, how can we be God's loving, diverse family? Paul's answer, or Paul's first answer, is prayer. Paul opens his letter with prayer and calls us to consistent and continuous prayer for each other. First with thanksgiving, recognizing what is God, what is, what is good in ourselves, what is good in others. We thank God for that. Praising God for the blessings and the gifts of God. Recognizing our own strengths, and, but also recognizing the strengths and the gifts of others. Then Paul prays wisdom and revelation that we may understand God's purpose in our lives, God's direction for our church. Paul speaks of great power that we have been given, you have been given. The same power that raised Jesus from death to life has been given to you. We have the power of God. Scripture says again and again, ask and you shall receive. Christ will give you all that you need. Anything that we need, God will give us. God's promise is that you, we, together, have tremendous power. We can do anything in Christ. Do we believe that? Do we believe that God can do anything through us and in us? Do we believe that we can work miracles of grace? Do we believe this church can be God's witness here on this corner, moving and shaking us and bringing people into God's love? Do we believe others will see God's love through our love? Others will see God through us. 
We have received that love of God. There is nothing more powerful than the love of God. We are called to live that love and to share that love in the world. There is nothing more miraculous. So believe in the miracle of God's promise and, and live into that love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Live that love. Live that love together. And just watch what God does. What amazing grace God pours over us through this church, through each of us, through this love that we share, through this amazing grace. You belong to God. Believe it and be blessed. Amen. I invite you to stand and share what you believe. Transition from the Apostles' Creed the early church and question of faith. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his own Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the conscious fire, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he was raised in front of him.
vision glorious of those who are part of the saints here in communion with us today as a reminder, also as various plant as a reminder of the presence of all who have come before us and all who are united as we are the church together. We are God's people in the world called to love one another. After the resurrection in the Bible, there are countless stories of Jesus appearing to his disciples and eating with them and sharing a meal of some kind. Um, in the first of those, uh, they are around the meal and Jesus breaks the bread and their eyes are open and they recognize Jesus standing there among them. And we believe that every time they come to this meal, this communion, this fellowship, this sacrament, Every time we break bread, Jesus is among us. And our eyes are open and we see Jesus with us, among us, in us. So today, may that happen to all of us. As all of us are welcome at this table, as Jesus welcomes all of us into God's presence and God's grace, so we remember Jesus with us now. Let us pray. Eternal God, Magnificent in glory, abundant in mercy and grace, we come to you this season of Easter as the awe of resurrection threatens to fade, aware of the world and all its darkness, with fear and anxiety just around the corner. We hear your voice, be not afraid, to face the future with confidence in your light, to trust you with all of our hearts, and to open our eyes to the vision of wholeness peace, and healing. We thank you for making all things new and for making all wonderful things possible. Jesus came with healing in his touch and was wounded for our sins. Jesus came with mercy in his voice but was mocked and despised. Jesus came with peace in his heart and met violence and death. By your power, Jesus broke free from the prison of the tomb, and his command, and at his command, heaven was opened to everyone, everywhere, for all time, and death was conquered by life eternal. With thanksgiving, we offer ourselves to you as we receive your gifts of bread and wine. We pray, quiet our fears, inspire our hearts, and empower our lives to be your witnesses in the world wherever we go. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of our risen Lord, who taught us to pray as we now pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I forgot as we were doing announcements to say that if you did not pick up your communion elements, you can do it now. So I'm going to see if anybody needs one raise your hand and one of the ushers will grab some, please. We are uh, using the self serve cups, so have those ready. And as I uh, break the bread, you may peel the bread or the cup as we go and uh, we will share together. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this remembering me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed with my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this remembering me. For every time you eat of this bread or drink of this cup, you proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus until Christ comes again in glory. These are indeed the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
God, by your Spirit, make our hearts burn within us, that we may welcome Jesus and face your future with hope and confidence. Help us to live by your vision and always in your presence. Help us to remember we belong to you. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.